For today's video, we have gotten our hands on the all new BMW X2. You can think of the X2 as a styling exercise based on the BMW X1. So the X2 is to the X1, what the X4 is to the X3, and the X6 is to the X5. You might be wondering why BMW is making so many different variants of their vehicles. Well, I think with the X6, it really was simply a styling exercise, but I actually think that with the X2, it makes perhaps a little bit more sense because the subcompact crossover category in America is full of two different kinds of vehicles in my mind. We have the BMW X1, the Audi Q3, and the Volvo XC40, which are more practical, sort of boxy shaped crossovers. And then we have entries like the GLA, the X2, the Evoque, and the Infiniti QX30. These are more style forward vehicles that give up a little bit of interior practicality to give you a sexier exterior shape. And in some instances, this category also looks a little bit more like a lifted hatchback, if that's something that you're looking for. I think that definitely applies to the X2, the GLA, and definitely the QX30 as well. Up front, the family resemblance is instantly obvious. No one is going to mistake this for anything other than a BMW. But you'll notice that the front end is a little bit different than the X1. This was designed to be a little bit meaner, a little bit sportier looking, especially different is this area right down there. We have standard LED headlamps, standard LED fog lamps as well, and a slight variation on the kidney grille in the middle. The first thing that BMW did to create the X2 from the X1 was shorten the overall body. So this is 172.2 inches long, about three inches shorter than the X1. The next thing they did was squish the body a bit. So this is actually 2.8 inches lower to the ground overall than the X1, but they didn't change the ground clearance. So instead, all they did was squish the body in the middle. So the roof line is closer to the ground, but the absolute bottom of the chassis is actually the same distance from the ground. Out back, we have distinctive tail lamp modules that have this little swoop right there in the side. That's an LED light strip. You'll notice, however, that the turn signals are not LEDs. And that's activated over there on that other side. You'll also notice that like many of the latest European vehicles in America, they actually have moved to red turn signals instead of amber turn signals. I'm told this is purely a styling decision. At the bottom of the bumper, we have twin exhaust tips. And you'll notice that the overall style is definitely more curvaceous than what we see in the BMW X1. So this hatch has a little bit more of a rake to it there and has some definite curves to it as it goes down. Around the world, you'll find a variety of different engines under the X2's hood, but in the United States, we get just one engine. It's a two liter, four cylinder turbocharged engine shared with the BMW X1 and the Mini Countryman. It produces 228 horsepower in this form and 258 pound-feet of torque. Power is routed to the front wheels by default via an eight-speed ISIN automatic transmission. That's right, this is a front wheel drive vehicle by default, just like the BMW X1 and the Mini Countryman. So that means that this is very different dynamically than the rest of the BMW lineup. And just about everything else that BMW makes is rear wheel drive. The transition to front wheel drive was quite logical for BMW and some might even say inevitable because every other entry in this segment is front wheel drive and front wheel drive vehicles like this generally have better packaging than rear wheel drive vehicles. So the area that's taken up by the engine here under the hood is a little bit less than it would be if this was a rear wheel drive vehicle, giving you more passenger room on the inside and better fuel economy, of course. Thanks to the eight-speed automatic transmission and the overall design of this vehicle, we get 25 miles per gallon average if you're driving the model that we're driving, which has all-wheel drive. You get one more mile per gallon combined 26 if you get just the front-wheel drive version. Front seat comfort is very good in the X2 thanks to the standard seat design. We find an extending thigh cushion, four-way adjustable lumbar support, and inflatable side bolsters. I don't find these seats overall quite as comfortable as the seats that we find in the Volvo XC40, but in terms of base trim to base trim, these seats are more adjustable than what we find in the base model of the Volvo. In that vehicle, you do have to pay extra for things like the extending thigh support. We also have a tilt telescopic steering column with a large range of motion, making it easy for short and tall drivers alike to find a good driving position. All these things together give this front seat a 10 out of 10 score. It's also worth noting that the passenger seat has the same range of motion as the driver's seat. Hopping back to the rear seats, that score definitely has to drop. Although I do have more headroom than I thought I would given the overall shape of the vehicle and the fact that we have the optional panoramic moonroof. My hair is barely brushing the ceiling, but I actually could sit upright here fairly comfortably and the roof line is fairly square. I've noticed that in a number of other very small vehicles lately that the roof line kind of curves in and hits you on the head right here on the side, but we don't find that in the X2. 
However, we do find more interior overall room in some of the competition. You'll notice on that chart on the side of your screen that combined legroom is very, very similar on a wide number of the vehicles in this segment, right around 77 inches or so. But headroom figures are quite different, and they're very important as well, because even if you had the same kind of legroom in the vehicle, but you had a lot less headroom, you end up leaning further rearward in order to sit back in the seat. And that's what we see in the X2 versus the X1. The front seat is definitely a little bit more reclined for me. And if I move all the way over to the right side of the vehicle, where I had a six foot five passenger adjust that seat for them, my legs are not really able to fit back here. They have to be sort of straddling the sides of the seat, although the footwell is a little bit larger than I had expected. Logically, because this is shorter than the X1, it's also closer to the ground, we find less cargo space behind this hatch. But it actually is more than I thought it would be at just over 21 cubic feet of storage space. Even though this is designed to be more of a style forward entry in this segment, it actually has just about the same kind of cargo space as the average entry in this segment, notably more than those smaller entries. For instance, if you were to buy an Audi Q3, you'd find about 25% less cargo capacity behind the rear seats. Thanks to the generous dimensions of this cargo area, I was easily able to fit four of our 24 inch roller bags back here. And of course this 22 inch roller bag has no problem fitting back here either. Now, if I were to lift up this cargo area load floor, we find even more storage and I can actually lift that up and out of the way. And I could put a 22 inch roller bag like this almost entirely underneath that floor. You can see that it's just barely not deep enough to completely hide the bag, but it is very close. And that means that you can fit quite a lot of luggage back here, even though again, this is trying to be one of the more stylish entries. As we look around the interior, keep in mind that we are not in the base model. So that means that we do have this optional large panoramic moonroof. You can see it extends right back there to just over the rear passenger's heads. We also have fixed height seat belts for the driver and front passenger and two way adjustable headrests. These are the leather seats, which are optional in the X2, but the bolstering and the seat motions are standard, as I said earlier. Moving over to the front doors, we find a large portion of soft touch materials, although keep in mind this is an entry level vehicle, so we still find hard plastics lower on the doors, which is pretty different than you find in most BMWs in the US. You'll also notice that the build quality is not quite the same as we find in the X3 or X4. For instance, this door handle right here is just not quite as nice feeling, but overall the interior is definitely to a high level in this segment. In terms of overall interior quality, I think that the X2, X1, and Volvo XC40 are the best in this segment. I think that they do beat the Infiniti, the Range Rover Evoque, and of course the Audi Q3. If we move over to the dashboard, we find more of that same trim that we found on the doors some faux stitching on this upper injection molded section of the dashboard. That's just an injection molded dash that's been after stitched. And then we find more stitching down here on this lower section, which is also a soft touch material. The glove compartment is a generously sized slot style glove compartment. I had no problem fitting a large tablet computer inside. In the center of the dashboard, we find the latest version of BMW's iDrive infotainment system with smartphone integration. We're seeing Apple CarPlay right here. It's worth noting that CarPlay is not standard and it's no longer a simple option. Instead, it's now moved to more of a subscription model. So do keep that in mind as you're doing comparisons with the competition. The big difference between this version of iDrive and previous versions is that we now have a touchscreen, as you can see right there. Even though the screen is a little bit far away from the driver, I personally found the touchscreen to be an easier way of interacting with Apple CarPlay than using the click controller in the center of the dash, although you have the option of using either input method as you can see. So when interacting with the BMW static menus like the communications menu, navigation menu, or the my vehicle settings, etc., I personally found the click controller to be a little bit easier to use than the touchscreen, although here you can use either input method as well. And then for CarPlay, I preferred to use the touchscreen. If you want to know more about BMW's iDrive system, there are videos on my channel that go into great detail about that. Over here on the driver's side, we find the start stop button and of course the auto start stop enable disable button. Buttons for that infotainment system, we have preset buttons that can be assigned to various different functions in iDrive. Track forward, backward, optical disc player right there, mode and band along with the power and volume knob. And then this little button right here below the hazard light button is kind of interesting. I'll zoom back up to the screen so you can see what's going on here. This allows you to adjust the active safety systems in this vehicle. So we can choose between everything being on and an individual mode where you can actually select the way different systems behave. Below the infotainment controls, we find the dual zone automatic climate control. This is also where you'd find the buttons for the heated seat controls. 
Then working our way below that, we have a storage cubby that is covered by these two roller covers. They sort of meet in the middle right like that. And this is where we find our two front cup holders. These are fairly small, so I did have difficulties fitting large takeout drinks in them. And then above that, we have a 12 volt power port and a very small storage area. You could sort of put smaller smartphones, pens, pencils, that sort of thing. Working our way back from there, we have a pretty traditional console shifter, which is also different than the rest of the BMW lineup in America. So this is not a digital joystick style shifter. Park is physically up there, drive is right down there. We move to the left for the sport mode, and you can also toggle for the manual mode. You pull towards the driver for gear up, push away from the driver for gear down, park again is right back there. To the left of that, we find controls very similar to other BMW models. This is where we would turn our traction control off change between the different sport modes. We have Sport, Comfort, and Eco Pro. We then have our parking sensor enable disable button. This vehicle also has the autonomous parking system and you'd use that button to access that menu. There's a button blank and then hill descent control which is quite smooth. We then have the controller for the iDrive system with direct access buttons to media communications, menu maps, etc. This also features finger writing recognition right on top. Then to the left of that we have the electric parking brake. As we see in other entry-level luxury vehicles, the center console is made from hard-touch materials, although this insert right here that goes around that console on the passenger side is a soft-touch material, very similar to what we see on the doors. It is stitched. Between the front seats, we have a padded center armrest. This opens to reveal a small area where you can put your smartphone. We do have wireless charging ability there, but the slot is fairly small, so you pull that back, insert your phone, and it will hold it in place but this slot is a little bit too small for my iPhone 7 Plus to fit in there. It doesn't quite fit in there with that case attached. However, you can keep it in the cubby for safekeeping. That ratchets up and down, and then below that we have a storage cubby where we also have a USB input and enough room for wallets, change, that sort of thing. But this does not get completely covered from the outside. So if that is ratcheted into position right like that, you can actually see that you can still see the wallet inside. Instead of a full LCD instrument cluster like we find in some of the competition, BMW prefers analog gauges. So we have an analog speedometer over here on the left, and of course a tachometer over here on the right. There is a small color LCD, you can just barely see in this graphic here, so it actually starts right over here by my finger on the right side and then continues just to over here on the left side. So the hill descent control readout that is ticking down from 20 miles per hour is part of that same color LCD. And then we have a physical gauge over here for the fuel level. This LCD is not quite as configurable as we find in some of the competition. It does give us things like our engine temperature, instant fuel economy. Uh, it changes between our fuel economy readout like that and the Eco Pro gauge that we see in other BMW vehicles. But the overall flavor of the cluster doesn't really change much when we move into sport because, of course, everything there is a physical gauge. This is also where we find things like our trip computer readout. The model that we're driving has an M Sport steering wheel, so we have the M logo down there at the bottom, and it's a three-spoke design with a small center airbag, sport grips on either side, and large shift paddles on the back of the wheel. You'll find the cruise control buttons over here on the left. We don't have adaptive cruise control in this particular vehicle. And then you'll find the infotainment controls over here on the right. Volume up, down, mode, voice command, phone button. And then this toggle controls the track forward, backward controls via the heads up display that we have above the instrument cluster. Over here on the left side of the steering wheel, we find a rather deep storage cubby. It's kind of interesting and a little bit unexpected. You could actually fit large smartphones, wallets, that sort of thing very easily inside that cubby. It's just below the headlamp controls. Surprisingly, the X2 manages to actually be faster 0 to 60 versus the X1. Even though the curb weight of the two vehicles is essentially the same and the power output from the engine is essentially the same. I suspect that BMW has done some additional tweaks perhaps to the transmission logic in order to get this faster 0 to 60. The model that we're driving right here, which is the all-wheel drive model, accomplished that task in 6.2 seconds. That puts this about one-tenth of a second slower than the Volvo XC40 T5 all-wheel drive. Although it is worth noting that the base engine in the XC40 is now going to be a less powerful engine, so that should be slower than what we're driving right here. That makes this one of the fastest non-performance models in the segment when you exclude the GLA 45 AMG. It also makes this notably faster than the last X1 that we tested. And the variance between this and the X1 at 6.8 seconds was so large that I decided to test a dealer-provided X1 model. And that dealer-provided model came in at 6.3 seconds. I'm not sure what went wrong with the X1 that we tested back in 2016, but I stand by that number because we did repeat that test multiple times and it came in at 6.8 seconds. 
I suspect that BMW has done some extra work reprogramming this automatic transmission to help improve those 0 to 60 times. It's worth noting that this 8-speed automatic transmission is the same 8-speed automatic that we find in a variety of different compact and subcompact luxury crossovers that use a transverse engine design. So this is actually the same transmission that we find under the hood of that XC40, for instance. When it comes to braking, this vehicle stopped from 60 miles an hour back to zero in 122 feet, which is fairly average for this segment. You can thank the 225 with tires that we have for that. That's also why the Volvo that we recently tested stopped shorter than this and actually had wider tires. It is worth noting that even though BMW is positioning the X2 as the sporty alternative to the X1, we get the same size tires on this vehicle and the same ground clearance. Therefore, this actually handles quite like the X1. In fact, it's very difficult to tell if there's much of a difference at all. We don't have access to a skid pad here at Alex Nautos, but publications that do have pointed out that this holds the road just about as well as the X1. There is a very slight difference, but it's not a very big one. And that logically means that in terms of overall absolute grip, this actually comes behind certain versions of the Volvo XC40 because you can get it with up to 245 with tires. And even though the XC40 is higher off the ground and a little bit heavier, it actually has a very similar driving feel to the X1 and the X2. It's very well sorted. BMW obviously programmed this all-wheel drive system to lock up its center coupling frequently compared to some of the alternatives out there. It's obvious, for instance, that we get much more power to the rear axle than vehicles like the Lexus NX or the Infiniti QX50, which even though they're not direct competitors to this, have a very similar drivetrain layout. And that has helped BMW preserve the driving dynamics that BMW is known for, even in transverse engine vehicles like this. Now, obviously, if you get the front wheel drive X2, then it's an entirely different story. It's not gonna be quite as dynamic as this model, although in neutral handling situations, it actually should be just a little bit better, perhaps, because it's going to be a little bit lighter. When it comes to our overall handling score, I'm going to give this an A, because even though this doesn't handle quite as well as certain versions of the XC40, this does extremely well in this segment. It is an awful lot of fun to drive out on your favorite winding mountain road, and we get a little bit more feel, and I think the overall polish level of the vehicle is just a hair above the XC40 overall. So in my opinion, I would say that this actually ties with the average version of the XC40, and you should pick one or the other based on your personal preferences. You know, do you prefer the, uh, the, the handling feel of this particular one, or do you prefer the grip level that we find in the XC40? Or a valid point, do you prefer the extra power that we find in that XC40? Out on a rougher road, like the gravel road that we're driving on here, the sportier mission of the X2 is obvious because this definitely feels firmer than the X1 or something like the Audi Q3. This doesn't feel quite as firm as the GLA 45 AMG or the top-end sporty trim of the Infiniti QX30, although keep in mind the sporty trim of the QX30 really is more of a front-wheel drive hatchback, more like a luxury GTI than a crossover like we're driving right here because its suspension is definitely lowered versus what we find in the X2. Very few options in this segment offer an adaptive suspension system, so you will need to be happy with the way the suspension is tuned as you're driving it away from the dealer lot. Although it is worth noting that the XC40 in top-end trim will be offered with an adaptive suspension system. Back out here on the paved road, it is obvious that the X2 has a very firm suspension. And that's why, in terms of our overall ride score, I'm going to give this particular model a B-. In our cabin noise test at 50 miles an hour, we measured 72 decibels in this cabin. That makes this a little bit louder than some of the competition. It's also worth noting that for some reason, this appeared to be a little bit louder than the BMW X1. In terms of overall fuel economy, we've been averaging 24 and a half miles per gallon over a week of mixed driving, which is right around the same that we were averaging in the Mini Countryman and the BMW X1. That's logical, of course, because they're using basically the same engine and all wheel drive system. That puts this a little bit below some of the efficient entries in this segment, but definitely in the thick of things overall. Overall, the X2 was pretty much what I expected, although it did provide a few surprises. For instance, the performance in this vehicle. I didn't expect it to go 0 to 60 that much faster than the last X1 that we tested. I expected this to come in right around that same 6.8, 6.6 seconds. And again, this was considerably faster than that. With that, let's move into pricing and see how the X2 stacks up against the competition. For 2018, the X2 starts at $36,400. That's a little bit more expensive than the X1 that starts at $33,009. As we see with the X4 and the X6, you do have to pay a little bit more for the style that we see in the X2, but we also get more features than the base X1 model as well, like the LED headlamps, 
manual thigh extension, and the inflatable bolster. So those are standard on the X2, they're not standard on the X1. So when you factor everything in, the actual difference ends up being between $1,000 and $1,200 between those two models. You get a reasonable amount of standard equipment on the base X2, like those 18 inch wheels, LED headlamps again, cornering lamps, LED fog lamps, the powered front seats, and faux leather upholstery. If you want real leather, you do have to pay a little bit extra. Now let's move on to the competition. Very clearly, the X2 is competing against the other BMW entry in this segment, the X1. BMW really has a winning sales formula, I think, with these two vehicles, and that's clear when you take a look at the sales numbers. BMW is absolutely crushing it in this segment, and by the end of 2018, it's very possible that the X1 will be the best-selling vehicle in this segment, and the X2 will be the second best-selling vehicle in this segment, kicking the Mercedes-Benz down to number three. That shouldn't be too much of a surprise, of course, because the X1 is a very competitive entry in this segment. It's large on the inside for a subcompact crossover. It's very practical. We have decent performance, good handling ability, and overall the vehicle is attractive and very well built. In a nutshell, the X2, as I said before, is simply a more stylish, slightly more expensive, slightly less practical X1. You can really think of it that way because that's basically what it is. But I have to say that before I got the X2 for a week, I was ready to dismiss it as a silly exercise and rule that the X1 was better in pretty much every way. But I actually think that I would buy the X2 over the X1 if I was shopping in this segment. I like the overall looks a little bit more than the X1. It's not quite as practical, but it's far more practical than I had expected it to be. In addition to that, everything in the X2 is just very, very well done. I've mentioned this before, BMW does a really good job of giving everything a high level of polish. So the X2 is not necessarily the best handling vehicle in this segment. It's definitely not the fastest in this segment. It doesn't stop the shortest. It doesn't have the most premium interior or the most comfortable seats exactly, but it has everything to a very high level. It's very, very well rounded. So while other vehicles may have the best acceleration but are more compromised in another area, that's not what we see in the X1 and X2. They're just very, very well rounded overall. Since style is obviously a factor when it comes time to purchase a vehicle, personally I'm willing to pay the extra $1,000 to $1,200 for the different styling that we see in the X2. It is a little bit more unique versus the X1, and that's why I would pick it over the X1. It also handles just a tiny bit better, and I like the overall form factor. Moving on, we have the Mercedes-Benz GLA, one of the older entries in this particular segment now. And as I said before, really a definite competitor to the X2 because of the overall shape and style of the GLA. This segment is sort of separated into two categories. We have the more boxy, more practical crossover looking vehicles like the X1, perhaps the XC40, and of course the Audi Q3. And then we have some entries that are more lifted hatchback in terms of overall style, like the X2, the QX30, and of course the Mercedes-Benz GLA. The GLA has a very well done interior, but I really think the seven speed dual clutch transmission lets it down too much for my tastes. It's oddly rough. What's more surprising than that is that that same transmission in the QX30 is actually a great deal smoother. So I think it's all down to the programming, the software that we see in the Mercedes model. But of course, a dual clutch transmission is never going to be as smooth as a traditional automatic, and that's exactly what we find in the X2. The GLA also gives up a little bit too much in terms of overall practicality, in my opinion. The back seat is just a little bit too cramped. The cargo area is not as practically shaped as we find in some of the competition. But in a way, that's also understandable because the GLA is one of the first entries in this segment in America. On the other hand, if you want the ultimate in performance in your subcompact European crossover, then look no further. There's absolutely no contest. It's going to be the GLA 45 AMG. It is absolutely insane. It is a ton of fun. It is very, very fast, handles incredibly, very nicely done interior, etc. And in that model, I don't mind the way the seven speed dual clutch transmission functions. Of course, that model is going to be pretty pricey. It starts at 53,350 and adding options could get you up to nearly double a base BMW X2. Next up, we have the Audi Q3 which wasn't introduced into the United States until after the GLA was introduced, but in Europe it actually existed before, and that's why it does feel a little less than fresh. We are expecting a brand new model for 2019, however, that is likely going to be very, very competitive. Everything that we've seen out of that vehicle really looks like it's going to put an awful lot of pressure on the top entries in this particular segment, but we may not see that for about a calendar year or so. 
The current model is definitely on the slow side. It handles extremely well for this category. Audi puts some very wide tires on most of the trims of the Q3, but it's also a little bit cramped in the back. Completing the series of highs and lows in the Q3, it is incredibly aggressively priced, and that is one of the really good reasons that you might want to buy one. If you're looking for one of the best deals going in this segment, likely around the end of the 2018 calendar year, the Q3 is going to be several thousand dollars less expensive than most of the competition. Of course, on the other hand, it is not going to feel as fresh or have the latest gadgets like we see in the X2, the XC40, or even the Mercedes-Benz GLA in its current form. Be sure and stay tuned because we hope to get our hands on the new 2019 model vehicle as soon as it gets launched. Moving on, we now have the Volvo XC40. The XC40 is arguably the youngest entry in this particular segment, and I really think it does show. As I've said before, I'd take the XC40 over the BMW X1, but the question here is, will it beat the X2? I would say yes, but by a hair. Handling is, honest to goodness, just about equal in the XC40 and the X2. It depends exactly on the road surface that you're driving on, whether it's very bumpy, etc., because the suspension is a little bit firmer in the X2, and what options you have on the Volvo. Certain versions of the Volvo may actually outhandle the BMW X2, and certain versions of the X2 may outhandle the Volvo depending on the surface and exactly how you've equipped the two vehicles. But dollar for dollar, you will likely find better handling in the Volvo than the BMW because it is simply less expensive. In addition to that, we have greater ground clearance in the Volvo, which is another surprising thing because even though it's higher off the ground, it still handles just about as well. It's because the Volvo has fairly wide tires compared to the base X2. The XC40 is also extremely well done overall, very much like what we see in the X1 and X2 actually. It's a very, very well-rounded vehicle. Despite being very boxy, the interior dimensions are also shockingly similar between the X2 and X1. We have identical combined legroom numbers. The X2 has a little bit more front headroom. The XC40 has about two inches more rear headroom. So if you really are concerned about rear headroom, the Volvo is going to win there. And they have about the same kind of cargo capacity, with actually the X2 having just a hair more than the Volvo. Acceleration is a bit faster in the Volvo because it has more power, and fuel economy is also, oddly enough, slightly better in the Volvo as well. The way the two vehicles drive is very, very similar because they use the same 8-speed automatic transmission in essence, and the all-wheel drive system design is quite similar as well. The overall driving dynamics of the two vehicles are also neck and neck, and that's because they basically share the same overall design themes. They both have transverse four-cylinder engines up front. They both have optional all-wheel drive. That means base model to base model. They both can be front-wheel drive, handle very much like one another. Top-end models are also going to feel very much like one another out on the road. When it comes to value, there's absolutely no question the Volvo is hands down the better buy here. You get more stuff for your dollar. For a little bit more than a base all-wheel drive X2, you could get the top-end XC40 inscription trim with the T5 all-wheel drive engine. That's going to give you nicer interior trappings than what we see in the BMW. Or for less than the X2 all-wheel drive, you could get the XC40 T5 R-Design all-wheel drive. With driving dynamics and overall handling ability that are essentially the equal of the BMW, or again, a very slight win depending on the trim, and a value proposition that definitely beats both the X2 and actually the X1 as well, the Volvo continues to be the winner for me in this segment. But perhaps what is a bit more shocking to some of you would be that I actually think that the X2 has pushed the X1 out of the number two spot, and I think it's a very close call between the two vehicles. I like the interior styling of the X2, perhaps just a hair better than the Volvo XC40. I like the way the interior is done in that vehicle. I also really like the way iDrive works, and it's a tough call for me there because the Volvo Census system, I like the overall design and theme of it. I like the LCD instrument cluster that is standard on all models, but I think the polish level on iDrive is just a little bit higher. But when it comes to the overall picture, the XC40 is just such a great option all the way around. It has to still be my top pick. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comments section below. As always, hit that subscribe button down there if you haven't already done so. Click up to the top of your screen if you want to support this channel, and I hope you do. You can also find us over at facebook.com slash alexandautos to see what I'm driving this week, and I'll see you later.